what is yoga? If you were to look at popular magazines or kind of the advertising about yoga, you might think that it's about um, exercise, you might think it's about breathing and stretching, chakras, crystals, movement. Um, it kind of seems like yoga is at the intersection of fashion, healthy eating, fitness. That's what most people's idea of yoga is. So I'm gonna tell you a very brief history of yoga. This is yoga, 5,000 years of yoga compressed into just a couple of minutes. So the very first evidence of yoga is about 5,000 years old. So about uh, 2700 BCE, before Common Era, it's, I don't know if you know, it's called BCE now, not BC. So BCE, um, there was uh, the region that is now Northern India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, that was called the Indus Valley. And there are some carvings that were found in that area that show people in yoga poses and meditation poses. So this picture here is called the Pushapti seal. And this is one of the earliest evidences people say that, oh, people were practicing yoga 5,000 years ago. But this is really all we know about what they were doing back then, is maybe they were sitting in a posture that looks like, um, looks like a yoga posture today. So after that time, we have um, more written evidence of yoga, and it's uh, called the Vedas and the Upanishads. And these were yoga teachings that were written down in India, and uh, people started to, to write this stuff down for several thousand years. And then, uh, in about 400 CE, there was a man called Patanjali who went through all of the Vedas and the Upanishads and he picked out the best of the best and he put it in what he calls, uh, what we call now the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. And that's what a lot of modern yoga is based on. It's on the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. So when somebody says they're doing yoga, it can mean many different things. So yoga teachers really should disclose who their teachers are and what type of yoga they're doing. So you know, is that the kind of yoga I wanna practice? Maybe you don't wanna practice every type of yoga that's out there. So um, with that in mind, I am going to tell you who my teachers are. And then you can decide if you wanna to listen to me. So um, the person in the upper left-hand corner, that was the person that I got certified from. Her name is Jennifer Folly and she teaches in Chaska, Minnesota. So that's where I got my certification. Um, I have three other teachers that I recognize. Um, one is Bhanti Sati, and he's in the lower right-hand corner, and he teaches at uh, Triple Gem of the North in Chaska, Minnesota. He's a Buddhist monk in the Theravada, um, he's a Theravada Buddhist monk. And the primary text that I teach from is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So the Yoga Sutras are this collection of teachings, and sutra means thread. They're these little tiny teachings. There's 196 of them. And um, when I go through uh, my lecture today, I will tell you the, uh, the exact sutra, and I'll read it to you, but you really need to have somebody, a teacher, to help you interpret it and help you understand what it means, because the sutras are very short and open to a lot of interpretation. But um, that's where I get my information from and where I teach from. So the goal of today's talk is to introduce you to the real purpose of yoga, as outlined in the Yoga Sutras, to impart the wisdom of the eight limbs of yoga, and to give you resources to use on the path of yoga if you desire to continue the journey. Okay, so now what is yoga? This is what yoga is from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So this is what he says, Sutra 1.2. Yoga is the ability to direct the mind exclusively toward an object and sustain that direction without any distractions. Can you do that? Can you focus on one thing and not have your mind distracted? It's really hard. It's really hard to not let your mind get distracted. So Sutra 1.3, then the ability to understand the object fully 
and correctly is apparent. So what this is saying is when your mind is turbulent, it's like this roaring ocean up there. You can't see anything. But when your mind gets still, it's like a still lake. And now you can see to the bottom. So that's what we're trying to do with yoga. We're trying to still our minds so we can see clearly. What would you do if your mind was perfectly clear and still? Would you be a better problem solver? Would you be kinder to other people around you? Would you be more confident in yourself, be able to act more decisively? Would you be less apt to be drawn into other people's dramas? Would you feel more relaxed and peaceful, maybe better able to sleep at night? Would you be more tolerant of your clients and patients and be able to serve them better as a veterinarian? There's lots of benefits to having a clear, calm, still mind. So yoga is the practice of stilling the fluctuations of the mind. So what prevents us from having a still mind? So this is what the sutras say. Sutra 1.42. Initially, because of our past experiences and ideas, our understanding of the object is distorted. Everything that has been heard, read, or felt may interfere with perception. So what that means is everything you've ever experienced, been taught, conditioned to do, all of the stories your mind makes up, all of the ideas you're attached to, everything that has come before is influencing you in this moment. So we start yoga by examining ourselves, our habits, our thoughts, and um, when, we, when we start to understand ourselves, that's how we can advance. So there's five common things that prevent a state of yoga. Um, and these are the things that commonly aff afflict the human mind. They're called the kleshas. So the kleshas are also called the five causes of suffering, the five poisons of the mind, the five obstacles to a clear mind. Um, and this is what the sutra says. The obstacles are avijja, misapprehension, asmita, confused values or ego, raga, attachment, Dvesa, unreasonable dislikes. Abhinivesa, clinging to life, insecurity. So those are the five things that get us all upset. So the first one is the most important one, and this is the root of almost everything. It's avidya, misapprehension. So this is what the sutra says. Misapprehension leads to errors in comprehension of the character origin and effects of the objects perceived. So we often determine um, that we have seen a situation correctly when in fact we are not. So our initial actions um, are based on uh, uh, incorrect information. And when that happens, that can sometimes lead to things that outcomes that we don't want. So here's an example. You walk into the treatment room and you see two of your technicians whispering and you assume it's about you because you just had an interaction with one of them and then instead of clearing it up, you just kind of internalize that and get mad and now you gossip about your technician later. There's all sorts of things like that that we do where uh, there's, we misunderstand a situation. 